Good evening. Take your hymnals and let's turn to number 175. That's 175. It's just like his great love. Let's stand as we sing. You may be sitting a long, long time, okay? <laughs> Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity and the privilege of coming to prayer meeting this evening. We ask your blessing upon everything that's said and done in it. We pray that you'll bless the singing and the study of the Word of God. Help us to learn it and go out and live according to it. Meet the needs of each one who's here and each one who's listening over the Internet. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Take your hymnals and turn to 202. 202, my Redeemer. Yeah. 
close. I can't do that if my hands are involved. Uh, there's a famous Roman road named Via Ignatia, which ran through Philippi from east to west. It was the trade route between east and west, and it would eventually become the way the gospel message would make its way to Philippi. You have to understand that God knew everything that he was doing, and he had the Romans build some roads so that the uh, traveling evangelists and apostles could get around the Roman Empire. I want you to take your Bibles and turn, please, to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, and I want to go through this text all the way through verse 40, because this particular chapter tells Paul's experiences before and during his time in the town of Philippi. In case you wonder, why am I doing this? Because I'm introducing the epistle to the Philippians. Now, I know that some study has been done in this recently, but I don't think there'll be any duplication, all right? So I decided I would just go right ahead and do this. Now, it says, starting in Acts 16 and verse number 6, when they, meaning Paul, Silas, and Timothy, had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, and then there's Bithynia, these are all areas, differing countries within what is today Turkey, okay? So that's the geography of it. Notice it says they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Sometimes it's not God's will for a particular individual to stay in one place. God has another place he's heading for. And 
Paul doesn't know what that place is yet. He's just seeking the Lord's direction and he's going here and he's going there and trying various doors until he finds one that's open. God does have a way of leading us through open and closed doors. And I would like you to understand a closed door is an indication of what God's will is not. Don't worry about closed doors. What that means is you're not supposed to be there, that's all. But there will be an open door eventually. There will be more closed doors to you or to me than there are open doors. We want to be where God wants us to be, doing what he wants us to be doing, and doing it in the way he wants us to be doing it, don't we? After they were come to Mysia, they assayed. Now, that word is a good English word, but it's not got the same meaning today that it used to have, okay? They attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not, did not allow or permit them to go into Bithynia. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. Now, Troas is on the coast of the Aegean Sea, which is between Turkey and Greece. But the, it says, And they, passing, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. At last, an open door is going to be available. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, meaning pleaded with him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Macedonia is northern Greece. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored. Notice the change from um, they to we. Why we? Because Luke has joined them. He's the writer of Acts. That's why it changes to we. We endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering or concluding that the Lord had called us for to preach, meaning in order to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course. It means we sailed straight to Samothracia, which is an island in the northern Aegean Sea between Turkey and Greece. And the next day we sailed, I put those words in there because they're implied, to Neapolis. Neapolis would be the seaport for Philippi. And from thence, from there, meaning from Neapolis, to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony. Now, when it says it's a colony, it means that it was a city which was controlled by Rome. And we were in that city abiding certain days. How many days? We don't know. It's all right. Certain days. We were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont. That's an interesting word. That's not one that's in my everyday vocabulary, but I know what it means. It means where prayer was accustomed to be made. That's where this group would gather on a regular basis. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither, the women who gathered there. Sounds like there weren't any men. Couldn't have a synagogue without having 10 men. So they had a bunch of ladies and they would get together and pray. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, meaning purple cloth or purple fabrics or purple goods, of the city of Thyatira, that's where she was from. So she wasn't uh, uh, from Philippi, which worshiped God, heard us. It sounds like she's not a Jew, but she heard them there. 
whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto, meaning she paid attention to the things which were spoken of or by Paul. And when she was baptized, she obviously got saved, and her household, how many infants were in her household? None. How do I know that? Infants don't believe in the gospel. Okay? So what is, what, why do some people want to promote this as suggesting infant baptism? They have to assume there were infants baptized. It's easier to assume that they weren't saved, therefore they weren't baptized. But everybody that did get baptized had been saved. So there were no infants being baptized. These are called, there are two of them in the New Testament, as I recall, and they're called household baptisms. I think the other one is actually in this chapter too. It's the Philippian jailers. Anyway, she besought us, saying, If we, you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. Stay there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, means a young female slave, possessed with a spirit of divination. She was possessed with a fortune-telling spirit, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying, by predicting the future. Was she accurate? Well, we aren't told whether she was or wasn't, okay? She might have been occasionally. She might have made some good guesses, all right? We don't know the answer. She didn't have the Holy Spirit directing her. The same, meaning this fortune-telling slave girl, followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. But they didn't want this kind of person, a demon-possessed individual, telling people that they are showing unto them God's way of salvation. And this she did many days. And Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, oh, it hit them in the pocketbook, didn't it? Sure did. Good. They needed that. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them or dragged them into the marketplace, a place where public assemblies and trials were held unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates. They were the highest governmental officials in the city of Philippi, saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans, since we are Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes. It doesn't mean they rented them out to somebody else. It means they tore off Paul and Silas' clothes and commanded to beat them. The word means to beat them with rods. Do you remember in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, Paul was beaten with rods three times. This is one of them. We don't know where the other two are. And when they had laid many stripes on them, you see, there was no limit on how many times the Romans could strike them with the rods. With the Jews and with the whips, 40 times was the limit. So they did 39 unless they miscounted and got one too many and got in trouble with God. So they cast them into prison, charging or commanding or ordering the jailer to keep them safely who having received such a charge, such an order, such a command, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. These stocks were wooden devices which were used to restrain their feet. And if you were having to be there with your feet unable to move, maybe elevated somewhat, you might be rather uncomfortable to say nothing of how your uh, 
bruises and wounds would be feeling. What would you be doing? Oh, me. Oh, yeah. Poor us, poor us. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. No, they weren't grumbling. They weren't complaining. You know, believers who are constantly grumbling or complaining are not good or effective witnesses for the Lord. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prisons, prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands, meaning chains, were loosed or were unfastened. And the keeper of the prison, meaning the jailer, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled, meaning that they had escaped. You know, if the jailer would have had any prisoners escape, he would be expecting to be executed. So you can see why he wanted to get it over with right then and there. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. And then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, what every soul winner wants to hear. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house, meaning your family, not your, the physical structure in which you live, but your family. Of course, they had to believe also in order to be saved. And they speak unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized. He and all his straightway or immediately. And when they had brought them into his house, he set meat, meaning food, before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house, meaning household or family. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeants who were the police officers saying, let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans. Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. You just didn't do this to Roman citizens. They should have checked before they did what they did and have cast us into prison and now do they thrust us out privily, meaning secretly? Nay, verily, no indeed. But let them come themselves and fetch or escort us out. And the sergeants, meaning the police officers, told these words unto the magistrates. And they feared when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and besought them. They pleaded with them or appealed to them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city, meaning to leave town. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted, meaning they encouraged them and departed. Well, after visiting with their fellow believers and encouraging them, Paul and Silas and Timothy left town and headed toward Thessalonica, where the Philippian believers sent gifts to them on several occasions. But it would only be a matter of a few weeks before they would be forced to flee for their lives from Thessalonica. Paul refers in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, you don't need to turn to that, to the treatment he had received in Philippi. He says, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. We were bold in our God to speak unto you, meaning you in Thessalonica, the gospel of God with much contention. It means in spite of great opposition. Wherever he went, he faced opposition. Well, 
After we've seen Paul's ministry in Philippi, we move on to observe Paul's circumstances at the time he wrote Philippians. You may be familiar with this, you may not be. Paul wrote Philippians from prison in Rome in approximately A.D. 61 or 62, about 10 years after Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke first arrived with the gospel message in Philippi. The book of Acts closes in about A.D. 60 with Paul in prison awaiting trial. Philippians seems to have been, been written after the close of Acts, but before Paul was released from his first Roman imprisonment. No correlations are able to be made between what is stated in Philippians and the events recorded in Acts to enable us to be more specific than this. In addition to Philippians, Paul also would write Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon at about this same time. These four epistles or letters are known as the prison epistles. Yes, he wrote 2 Timothy from prison also, but it's not included in the group known as the prison epistles, all right? I want you to have that straight in case you ever want to take a course on the prison epistles. You might as well know what you're studying, all right? So as Paul writes Philippians, he's hopeful of being released soon. Whereas in 2 Timothy, which is written about five years later, Paul is expecting to be executed. Certain statements in Philippians hint that Paul's trial may have already concluded and that he was only awaiting the verdict, whether that would be life or whether that would be death. He was awaiting that verdict at the time he wrote this epistle. Although the verdict could call for him to be executed, Paul was expecting to be released from prison, and he expresses his expectation in Philippians 1, 19 through 26. You might want to look at that. I'm not preaching on that tonight, but um, we'll go through it just very briefly. Philippians 1, 19 through 26. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. He's not talking about the salvation of his soul here. It's to my deliverance from prison or to my deliverance from my execution. I know that this shall turn to my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. In other words, the support provided by the Spirit of Christ, which is a reference to God the Holy Spirit according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. That's a good idea for you and me as well, to seek to be magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, whether it's the way we live or whether it's in our deaths. You know, unless the rapture comes, we're all liable to experience that death one of these days. Some of us might be there a little bit sooner than others, but we never know. It's kind of, uh, I was reading here the other day in, about Barzillai, and he was very, very ancient, 80 years old. I thought to myself, that doesn't look so bad to me anymore. <laughs> I don't play baseball or football anymore, though. I just want you to know I, I gave all that stuff up when I was a teenager. Well, no, I played baseball into my 40s, but I, I don't feel quite as young as I once did, but I don't feel like Barzillai did either. And then Moses, he didn't even get started in his ministry till he was 80. And then he went to 120 while leading the Israelites out of Egypt through the wilderness wanderings. How long are you going to live? Who knows? Really, who cares? I mean, it, it, what is it? We, it is what we are. Now, when we can't move and we can't 
think, and we can't eat, and we can't pick up anything, we get to the point where, like that song, if I were better dead, okay, I take my cares to Jesus. We don't know. All right, back to this. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Living for us, like for Paul, should be magnifying Christ and living faithfully for him as long as he gives us breath. But don't worry about death. It's like going through a doorway. The process may not be pleasant, but the result is very pleasant. It's gain. We'll be better off than we are now. We've never been that well off in our lives previously. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, but what I shall choose I want not. What? <laughs> that's a past, or no, that's the present tense of wit, I think it is, W-I-T. Those are words we don't use anymore. It means I don't know. For I'm a straight betwixt two. It sounds like something we would say today, I'm in between a rock and a hard place having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you, but you need me. You Philippian believers need me. Now, Christ didn't need him there. Christ could have sent somebody else, but Christ had sent him there and they needed him. And having this confidence, Paul says, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. At the same time, in Philippians 2.17, Paul recognizes that he may soon be executed. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. And then he goes back the other way in Philippians 2.23 and 24. Paul indicates that he's expecting to be able to visit Philippi soon. But you know, to be able to visit Philippi, he's going to have to get out of jail first. Him, Philippians 2, 23 and 24. Him, meaning Timothy, therefore I hope to send presently. So soon as I shall see how it will go with me, but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall come also, meaning to Philippi, shortly. Paul would eventually be released from prison and enabled to continue his missionary travels for a few years. He would then be rearrested and imprisoned in Rome a second time before his execution in approximately A.D. 67. But he would meanwhile, while, while, out, out, of, while out of prison, he would write 1 Timothy and Titus between these two imprisonments. Well we move on to Paul's circumstances at the time, I mean, excuse me, from Paul's circumstances at the time he wrote Philippians to the message of Philippians. Why did he write Philippians? Well, it was written as a thank you note for a gift sent by the believers in Philippi. This gift was apparently delivered by a man named Epaphroditus, and, you know, I said the other night that um, if you were looking for a new name, there's one you could select, okay? Uh, it was Christmas the other time. This time it's Epaphroditus. But specifics regarding this gift are not known. This was not the first time the Philippian believers had sent gifts to Paul. When he was in Thessalonica, they sent gifts to him on at least two occasions, in Philippians 4, 15 through 17, you don't need to turn to it. We read, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated or shared with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity, 
not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. I may have told you on a previous preaching occasion here in this church, you need to be careful when you read to know whether you is plural or singular. Okay, let me give you an example. In John 3, Jesus said, I say unto thee, ye must be born again. What's the difference? If it starts with T, thee, thou, thy, thine, it's always singular. If it starts with Y, ye, you, your, it's always plural. So in John 3, here's a problem with some of the modern translations. They say, I say unto you, you must be born again. Who's the you? Well, in their translations, it would seem to be Nicodemus. But it's I say unto thee, meaning you, Nicodemus, ye, all of you, whoever, whoever was involved besides Nicodemus is included. You must be born again. Uh, enough of that. Paul left Thessalonica and fled to Berea. But Berea was still in Macedonia. However, when Paul fled from Berea, he left Macedonia and entered Achaia. Apparently, Epaphroditus advised Paul of some difficulties among the believers in Philippi between Euodius and Syntyche, which also involved others. You get the impression as you begin reading through Philippians that there's some problems in the church. The church is not unified like it ought to be. In Philippians 1.27, for example, it says, Only let your conversation be, meaning live or conduct yourselves as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. Uh, affairs has a different meaning in modern English, and we don't mean that here. It means that I may hear of the things concerning you, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Why would he say that? Because they weren't standing fast in one spirit and they weren't striving together with one mind. You've got to read a little bit between the lines to pick that up. Philippians 2, 2 through 5 Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife, meaning a contentiousness or vainglory, which would be excessive ambition, but in lowliness or humility of mind, let each esteem, consider, or regard other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Why is he having to say that? Because it wasn't that way and it needed to be. Philippians 3, 13 through 16, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, meaning to have attained it or achieved it, but this one thing I do, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect, meaning as many as are mature. He's not speaking about the age, you know, I'm more mature than I used to be. But that's not the idea here. The idea is you've gone along in your spiritual maturity. Be thus minded. And if anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this unto you. Nevertheless, let us, whereunto we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Why did he have to say that? Because they were not united. 
And then you come to the, he opens it up in Philippians 4, 1 through 3. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech you, Odious and Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I treat thee also, true yoke fellow, true companion or partner, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Unfortunately, problems between two saved individuals in the same church are not terribly uncommon. And they're often left unresolved. And it always adversely affects the entire church. Paul was preparing to send Epaphroditus back to Philippi. And Paul would like to take advantage of his return to send this letter to the Philippian believers along with him. In verses 8 and 9 of chapter 4, Paul lays out an appropriate and unified mindset for their consideration. And this is in contrast to any disunity or squabbling among themselves. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. That's a couple of verses it would be good for us all to memorize if you haven't already done so. Now, having considered all the background, let's take a look at the opening greeting in verses 1 and 2. First, that's Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul and Timotheus. Uh, by the way, these are verses, you know, you really read over fast, right? Now, there's more in there than you'll, you want to skip. Learn what's in there. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Paul identifies himself as the writer of this letter and indicates that Timotheus, or Timothy, was with him when he wrote it. Paul describes himself and Timothy as the servants of Jesus Christ, where servants is the term which means slaves. They had voluntarily enslaved themselves to Jesus when they gave themselves to him. It suggests that they regarded themselves as existing for the sole purpose of doing the will of their master or Lord, regardless of what it was. They no longer regarded their lives as being their own. Now, there's a good example for you and for me to follow. We need to be sold out to the Lord, his slaves, seeking to do his will and existing solely for the purpose of doing that will, whatever it turns out to be. Paul writes to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. It's to each and every believer in Jesus Christ was, who was living in Philippi. They were saints in that they had been sanctified or set apart for Christ's use. Note that the word order of Christ Jesus emphasizes the fact of his being the Messiah. With the bishops and deacons is together with the bishops and deacons, which indicates that there were only these two church offices among the believers at Philippi. A bishop is an overseer or superintendent. He's responsible for overseeing the work of the local church. The fact that bishops is plural indicates that there was more than one bishop in Philippi. A bishop is another name or designation for the man who is the pastor or for the man who is the elder. As a bishop, he oversees the work of the local church. 
As a pastor, he shepherds, tends, or feeds the flock, meaning the local church. As the elder, he's in control of the assembly, meaning of the local church. Although three terms apply to the same individual, there's no such thing in the New Testament as a bishop who is not both a pastor and an elder. There's no such thing as an elder who is not both a bishop and a pastor. And there's no such thing in the New Testament as a pastor who's not both a bishop and an elder. Now, different denominations will not agree with what I just said, and it's their privilege to be wrong if they choose to be, all right? The two New Testament passages are sufficient to demonstrate what I've just said. In 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, Peter writes, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And then he says, feed the flock of God which is among you, which is the pastor's main responsibility in the church. Feed the flock. Feed them what? Bible. Teach them the Bible accurately, thoroughly. Don't teach your ideas. Teach God's ideas. You're better off. Feed the flock. Taking the oversight. That's the, that's the, the uh, superintendent, the bishop. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready or a prepared mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. Do you see that? We're not to be lords over you. Leaders, examples, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. The other passage, it's the same sort of thing. I'm not going to go through it in the interest of time, but it's Acts 20, 17 through 35, where Paul is meeting with the elders of the church at Ephesus and he says, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his blood. The fact that bishops in Philippians is plural suggests that there may have been a number of local churches in Philippi. Most likely they were house churches. You know, they didn't have big buildings like this. They'd have a, a few families come into one house. And each house would have its own pastor. Deacons were servants. They were the men who were placed over the temporal matters of the local church. They were not church bosses as if they had authority over the elders, bishops, or pastors. The office of deacon was first established in Acts 6. I won't go through that, but if you'd like to read it, go ahead and read it. Then he goes on down in verse 2, Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is unmerited or undeserved favor. The Philippian believers had experienced unmerited or undeserved favor when they trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, just like you and I have. But this grace in this verse is not speaking of saving grace. Why not? Because they already had saving grace. The grace mentioned here is something these saved Philippians or these Philippian believers still needed. Something which would go beyond the grace they received at salvation. It is grace which will enable them to live their Christian lives. You know, when it comes time for you to die, you'll need dying grace too, okay? There's a lot of grace you need. He giveth more grace, James writes. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, Hebrews 4.16. It indicates that believers have additional grace for daily living readily 
available to them. And then peace. Peace is likewise something the Philippian believers received at salvation. According to Romans 5.1, all believers have peace with God because they've been justified by faith. But justification took place at the instant of our salvation. It's a judicial declaration by God the Father that we are righteous. And from that instant on, God treats us as righteous. However, the saints in Philippi were already saved. So this peace the Apostle Paul is wishing on them is not the peace they received at the time of their salvation. They already had peace with God. Instead, Paul is wishing peace, which will enable them to live the Christian life. It goes beyond the peace with God they received at salvation and comes as a result of the fruit of the Spirit being produced in their lives. You know the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, comes as a result of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you as a believer. Romans 8 indicates that if the Holy Spirit's not in you, you're not a believer. We have to understand He's producing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. It's also the same peace referred to in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. As a result of their praying, the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I said on Sunday evening, why pray when you can worry? Maybe we should change that. Why worry when you can pray? That's the point of Philippians 4, 6, and 7. This grace and peace come from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, which indicates the source of both grace and peace. They weren't able to go and buy grace or peace at a local store, but they were able to obtain both of them from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes people want peace at all costs or at any cost, but peace purchased through compromise won't last. The only source that readily provides grace and peace that will last is God the Father and God the Son. Now notice, our makes God the Father's relationship to believers very personal. God is the Father of all believers. And Christ is our Lord or Master. He's the Lord or Master of all believers. Some people teach that Jesus is inferior to God the Father. But this verse contradicts this sort of false teaching. The fact that both grace and peace proceed equally from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ indicates that God the Father and Christ are equal. If they were not equal, grace and peace would have to come from God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Although the Lord Jesus Christ voluntarily subordinated himself to the Father, this was only for the purpose of a proper administration. There is no way in which Jesus is, in, is inferior to God the Father. He possesses the very same attributes and could say to Philip, he that has seen me has seen the Father. The fact that grace and peace come from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ also indicates that God the Father and Jesus Christ are two distinct persons within the Godhead. Well, we have finished verses 1 and 2. I challenge you to read ahead verses 3 through 11. That's what we plan to look at next week. And we'll spend all of our time basically in Philippians instead of introducing it next time. Are you going to do the prayer or am I supposed to, Jess? Hey!
Let's pray while he's coming, okay? Our Father, thank you for this portion of thy word. Help us to understand it and to apply its teachings to our hearts and minds in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for those words, Dr. Q. We appreciate that. All right, we'll take time for our prayer and praise tonight. I just had a few, few mentions. I'd like the first one, I guess, to be some very exciting news. As you knew, and I hope, I trust that many of you have been praying about our insurance situation. Um, I try to be a realist and not exaggerate things, make them any worse than they are if it's bad news, and try not to be too excitable if it's good news. But that was a very, very serious situation, very serious. So much so that come the end of August, roughly the end of August, August 28th, our current insurance policy was going to be effectively canceled, and if we didn't have insurance secured, we could not operate. Well, through the very industrious efforts of Brother Don Tunstall and working with uh, a man's name, I'll just say the first name, just avoid any embarrassment going out over the internet, but uh, Matthew is his name, with insurance companies, they have officially, now we've not signed any contracts yet, but they've given us an underwrited policy that we just as a church need to vote to increase from the current 5,000 to a 3,000 more, and we will have insurance. So that is a tremendous answer to prayer. I wanna give public thank you to Brother Don's efforts, uh, working aggressively, uh, still in Christian spirit, but uh, just, uh, I can't think of a better word than aggressively, uh, several days worth of just trying to right some wrongs and uh, take care of this church as a caretaker. So I just want to say thank you to him. I want to thank the Lord. I, I do not want to gloss over the Lord's involvement in this. Many have been praying. I, if, I would almost say probably everybody has at some point that this was looking very dire and we didn't have many raw ingredients to think that it was very hopeful well in our weaknesses is where the Lord wants to show his strengths is it not so I want to be sure that we mark down a praise and that is going to be something that we'll need to vote on Sunday Lord willing uh, just to increase the budgeted amount which we had budgeted 5,000 for our other our current policy and this will be a slight increase um, but far less than we anticipated uh, up into the tens of thousands. So let's just continue to pray for those details to finalize, but also thank the Lord for his direction on the insurance. Uh, Brother Jeff is not with us tonight, but I think that he was tuned in live stream. Miss Susie had some injections on Monday. Had to get up very early. Uh, it also came to my attention she was rewarded with Chick-fil-A for breakfast. So... <laughs> It was, it was worth the effort, it sounded like, but uh, those injections, just some continued recovery for her. So let's remember Miss Susie and Jeff as well, Jeff and Susie, as we know, and I don't want to belabor the point, but that's, that's been some, some ongoing things in their family for quite some time. And I don't remember how many times Brother Jeff told me he got the COVID bug. I think it was four, if, if I'm not mistaken. So just, just rounds of attacks on the family, many of these things being physical, but just pray for them and um, any other needs that they have. Miss Lois, it come to my attention, Miss Lois is traveling, so let's pray for safety for her, her family. I think of Joetta as well. Anything of yours? Brother Allen. Uh, Steve Humphreys called me and said that uh, his he gets nausea, uh, and they have him on a medicine for, I guess, uh, early stages of diabetes. Okay. And so if he gets nausea, he doesn't want to uh, come to church or, or go out because it's sure. so limited. Okay. So pray for Steve and where he can get adjusted. To Absolutely. Medicine. Thanks for mentioning that. Let's remember Brother Steve Humphreys. Uh, just really battling some nausea, and that affects his mobility. And with blindness, his mobility is already significantly hampered in many ways, but he certainly has been a good testimony to each one of us, hasn't he? Anything else tonight? Uh, Brother Dean. I just want to thank God for <clears throat> my niece delivered two 
healthy baby girl yesterday. Praise the Lord. Uh, well, one of them had a little bit of sugar issue, but uh, they're getting it straightened out. So I just thank God for it. Amen. Dean, given praise for it was your niece. Okay, safe delivery of two babies, huh? Yeah. Was that a buy one get one? Were they twins? <laughs> yeah, they were. Right, they're right out of the twins. All right. How about that? I'll thank the Lord for that. That's the another hand, Miss Arleta. We've had a death in our family in New York. Oh, I'm sorry. And I ask, just pray for that family. I really don't believe any of them are actual born again believers. Okay. And their parents are deceased. So it's questionable just how everything's going to be taken care of. Okay. And that was a death in your family? It's the Smith family. Okay. Yes. They're relatives. Okay. Ms. Arleta mentioned a death uh, for the Smith family there in New York. Really tough time. Sounds like uh, definitely salvation is needed throughout the family. The parents are deceased. So let's just pray for some of these details, certainly for the souls that are involved, and, uh, and, and comfort. You know, whether we have saved or unsaved people, obviously eternal differences there, but we all have emotions, and we all have voids in our lives when we lose somebody. Um, this brings to mind Miss Wanda, the recent passing of her mom. Let's remember, there's still probably some residual needs sometimes, and uh, wisdom is still needed, as well as the emotional uh, patch, um, comfort. Anybody else tonight? Yes, Miss Helen. Uh, my neighbor just passed away suddenly, oh, no. and um, she's a believer, and the children have strayed. So I'm just praying that um, through the service on Saturday uh, and this time they've had together this week, that their eyes would really be toward the Lord and they'd be called back to know Him and um, live for Him. Amen. They really, they really not. Okay. Thank you for that mention. Ms. Helen's neighbor uh, passed away unexpectedly, thanking the Lord, though, that she was... I didn't, was it a she? She was saved. Uh, the children, though, that's a, a continued need. They have strayed. Sounds like the service is scheduled for Saturday. So let's pray for the Lord. We'll pray that the Lord will bless that service and even work in some people's lives. They'll return to him. Anybody else this evening? Okay, doesn't look like it. We'll break up into groups for the next few minutes and... Never overlooking or glossing over thanks to the Lord for what he allows us to do and his many, many provisions in life, but uh, then also just casting these burdens on him, knowing that he does care for us.